All right, we'll go ahead and get started as folks continue to join the call. And we would like to start this meeting by acknowledging that we are all wherever we are on the ancestral land of the Coast Salish peoples, the traditional home of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Swakamish, Tulalip, and Makushuk nations. We do the land acknowledgement to acknowledge the first peoples of this land and to ensure that we do not enforce or support the erasure of their history and their continued resiliency in this land. With that, I would like to invite everyone to quickly introduce yourselves and then we will go to some announcements and get into the discussions of the day. I am Introducing myself, I think, in a new capacity for the first time today, I am Patience Malaba. I am the new executive director at the Housing Development Consortium, and I am excited to continue to work with all of you on this critically important work on how do we advance sustainability within our affordable housing sector, uh, and how do we do so with this really focused equity lens as has been embedded within our strategic plan. With that, I will call on folks to introduce yourselves and I'll stop sharing screen so we really have that in-person film the virtual room and then we'll come back to the screen sharing. Sandra, how about you kick us off in introducing yourself? Certainly. I am Sandra Mallory with the City of Seattle's Office of Sustainability and Environment, and I'm the Buildings and Energy Program Manager. And I'll turn it over to Marty. Um, Marty Gleaves with Bellwether Housing. I'm the Senior Facilities Manager, and I manage the bulk of the utility upgrade projects and whatever else we do to try and meet whatever it is we're meeting about here. So. And I'll go to Becky. Hi, everyone. Becky Bicknell, Client Relationship Manager with Walsh Construction. We're a local CC that does a lot of affordable housing work. Thank you, Becky. How about Jen? Hi. Oh, good. I'm not on mute. Hi, everyone. I'm Jen Lebrecht. I'm with the City of Seattle Office of Housing. I'm our Market Incentives, Land Use, and Sustainability Manager. Nice to be here. Thank you, Jan. Ryan, and if you want to take someone right after. Oh, hi, I'm, I'm Ryan with the Raffin Company, uh, general contractor, uh, project manager here. Um, Robert, how about yourself? Uh, Robert Shepard, uh, founder of Vital Housing, uh, Impact Decarbonization Preservation Fund, uh, focused on affordable housing. Thank you, Robert. Sammy? Oh, sorry. Um, Nicole. Hi there, Nicole Ballinger, City of Seattle, the Buildings and Energy Strategic Advisor, working on this project and also support programs um, that kind of tee those up, other things um, as well. So I will pass it on to Madeline. Hi, I'm Madeline Kostich from Seattle City Light, I'm leading the utilities building electrification strategy. Bambi. Bambi Chavez, uh, HDC. I am the Member Programs and Services Coordinator. I'm also the Project Manager for this project. So should you need anything, reach out to me and I will be happy to get back to you. Um, and last but not least, I think we're at Sandra, right? We kicked off with Sandra. Yeah. Well, then there we are. We are not even last. She is first. Yes. <laughs> Well, thanks everyone. Uh, going back to our agenda really quickly, announcements on communications. We now have a new building performance standard website. I don't know, Bambi, if you want to go ahead and post that in the chat for folks to be able to review. And remember this is intended to increase the presence around this building performance standards work that this task force is doing 
and engage the broader HDC membership. So we encourage that you share as widely as you can, uh, and we will be populating the web page with resources that folks can use. So if there's any critical new research or reports that you really see as important to include, please share them with Bambi um, and we'll keep the website updated. Then coming up uh, is a learned lunch on April 28th. Uh, this is where we will be sharing Ellie the work that you have been doing and some of the draft recommendations, thinking that this group has been in discussions on. And we hope we can get as many folks attending that meeting and many of you joining to speak about the work that you have been uh, advancing so far. The other announcement that we have is there is a letter that has been uh, unanimously agreed upon by the board in expressing support for the building performance standards policy development work. Uh, and that letter would be sent to the broader membership. I recall seeing in the notes that we, were, we had committed to send it in March. We will be sending it uh, sometime this month to really get it in front of members, to remind them of their support uh, and their sort of an invitation for input in this process for members. We Keisha, will... can I ask a clarifying question on that? Yes. Is that a letter of support for building performance standards or more just for HDC engaging in this issue? It is both. It's for developing a building performance standards that supports the affordable housing sector. It's not really supporting a policy given that the policy is not yet released, but the process of developing the, process, the policy and the resilient version of its work. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. And then on Monday, June 6th, we plan to host a Leonard lunch where we will uh, be reviewing the final recommendations that we would have moved to the city and engaging the broader membership and giving them an update on where that work is. Anything else that I missed, Bambi, that you would like to expand on? We're all set to move forward. All right, so we'll shift gears to the next agenda item here. And we want this to be really a conversational meeting for today and be in conversation about how we get to the vision that we can collectively define for ourselves and the path of getting there what it would take for us to achieve and net zero buildings for our sector. How do we decarbonize our sector? I think the latest uh, report from the IPCC, if you saw it, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, really emphasizes that we are closing in on the window to reduce the impacts of climate change overall. And that's been, I think, at the top of all of our minds. And one thing that they emphasize is that as housing, as the housing sector, we are in a unique position in terms of new development, uh, but also in terms of existing buildings and making sure that we are proactively retrofitting, retrofitting uh, those. I mean, we all know this is more like uh, preaching to the choir on how much residential uh, energy use is a contributor to uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But the proactive question is often how do we advance any strategies and be inclusive of affordable housing uh, as a sector uh, because we know that the people who are served by this community are disproportionately low-income people, disproportionately Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. Uh, and how can we advance a targeted universalism approach of not living behind the sector, but really taking on the leadership of driving the work with cutting edge solutions of defining a roadmap proactively that is not inhibited by the cost that we know comes with 
uh, these changes. Uh, and the, most of the costs being upfront. Um, and then of course, there may be costs in terms of operations, but there are technical tools that can be considered there to continue to reduce the cost. But how do we get there knowing the hurdles that we currently have? Knowing that we have uh, capital needs assessments that have specific set timelines, what needs to be shifted there? What's the flexibility that can support uh, our members in being able to do that before we even think of government and they are um, stepping in to provide incentives? And that's the exercise we will do later on today uh, with questions posed for you, with a draft that we have, Steve and I have pulled together uh, and wanting to hear your feedback of, is this the path of getting there? And are we actually wanting to go to net, net zero uh, buildings or is it a different place that folks want to get to? So this is really inviting your very sharp minds and helping us think of collectively defining that um, visionary picture that we want to get there. And what assistance do we need? Can we fully define that assistance? I think we've heard over and over how uh, costly it is to do this work, uh, how much there will be technical assistance needed for some of the smaller builders and even the larger builders. But can we fully define what that assistance has to look like in, in uh, building uh, stepways to our actual place that we want to get to in terms of a visionary net zero buildings, uh, affordable housing sector. So I'm pausing that as a challenge to all of you. We'll invite that you think of those questions for now, and then we'll shift gears to hear a little bit from the city, just high level, what their thoughts are in looking at their own landscape of getting to a net zero emissions. And can we get some context uh, comparison with what we know the state is doing, which is more energy performance and not so much of the greenhouse gas emissions reduction that the city uh, would rather be. And we think a stricter approach, I think that that was a discussion that this group had last meeting, a stricter approach is how we get to cutting edge solutions and how we become innovative. So Sandra, if you could just give us some context on where the city is, not as a policy specific discussion for now, just an overview of that context and folks can ask questions and then we'll come back after you have presented to look at our pathway that we have drafted based on past conversations and based on some additional research that we've done for this group to begin to inform fully the recommendations that could move forward. So over to you, Sandra. Sure, do you want me to go ahead and share my screen? And um, let's... so let's see here. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. Um, let me see if I can blow it up a little bit. Um, so uh, those were great intro remarks, patience and talk about context. And we're now looking at a, um, you know, clear as mud Excel spreadsheet. So recognizing that we're kind of switching gears, but the, the, Background here is, you know, some of the internal discussions we've been having, um, you know, Patience and Steve and Bambi and I are really understanding, trying to get a handle on what is it the state is doing with their energy standards? How do, how does what Seattle might be proposing play in? And it's, it's a very confusing landscape. And so, wanting to make sure that we provide a little bit of background and just sort of understanding of what is happening, what's known, what's not known, um, and therefore um, what we're thinking in, you know, at the city. And so I'll start, you know, with this, this top uh, section here, which is the Washington Clean Building Standards, what they're calling tier one. 
And these are for larger commercial buildings and there are regulations in place for those buildings and there are energy uh, intensity targets. So energy use per square foot targets for these buildings and compliance for those starts in 2026. And then it, you know, for the largest buildings, the following year, the next tier of buildings, the following year, the next tier. And then those targets get um, increasingly more stringent every five years and every five years then these commercial building owners need to comply with them. Um, the lower targets have not been established yet. That is something that the Department of Commerce um, will be working on. So it's unknown exactly what they will be, but they will be more stringent. So what's in place at the state level are energy targets for larger commercial buildings. There are also incentives available for larger, meaning uh, greater than 50,000 square feet for larger multifamily buildings. This last legislative session um, at the state level, this uh, clean building standards was updated uh, to include what the state is calling tier two buildings. Tier two buildings are smaller commercial buildings. So commercial buildings, 20,000 to 50,000 square feet, or actually greater than 20,000 to 50,000 square feet, as well as multifamily buildings over 20,000 square feet. Um, this, is, this is legislation. It will you know, require significant rulemaking to be implementable. And there are lots of questions about how exactly this will play out. The first thing we know is that there will be rulemaking around, you know, benchmarking. So these buildings, these tier two buildings will be required to submit energy uh, reports to the state as well as energy management plans and operations and maintenance plans. Um, the anticipation that the legislation calls for those starting in 2027. Um, it's unclear whether all of these buildings will need to do that at the same time or whether it will be phased in. So again, rulemaking. So um, encourage folks to get engaged in rulemaking if you wanna have uh, input on this. And then the next uh, issue is that these tier two buildings, energy targets will be set for them. Um, and that will also be a rulemaking process. You know, the first step is that there's a report to the legislature that uses the benchmarking data that's been gathered from these buildings to understand what those energy targets should be. Um, and the expectation is that rulemaking will be in 2030 um, and it will establish the energy targets that these tier two buildings will need to be. Those first energy targets are likely, though not necessarily, it says no earlier than, to begin in 2031 for commercial buildings. Um, there's legislation also states that multifamily buildings may be on a longer timeline. So it's unknown when the first uh, compliance would be required for uh, multifamily buildings. So legislation has been passed to incorporate uh, smaller commercial and multifamily buildings into the clean building standards. And there is still lots of work to be done to determine exactly how that will be implemented. So that leaves the city of Seattle with some knowns and many unknowns in terms of how uh, we might consider building performance standards. We are have been conceptualizing uh, building performance standards as primarily being about carbon um, and that our focus is on reducing emissions. With that said, there is discussion amongst our technical advisory group, amongst you know, members of the HDC about whether or not the city should have energy standards that would apply to some of these tier two buildings that are not yet being covered by the state. So that's an open question um, and one that we don't have an answer to and would love input on. Um, 
what we are considering in at this point, and again, this is all part of the stakeholder engagement process to get input and determine what makes sense. Um, and so this is really a straw dog that we've set up partially so that we can do some analysis of impacts, um, which is, you know, that if we are, that first and foremost, we wanna be coordinated with the state. And so we assume that we, uh, emissions target, we would establish emissions targets for commercial buildings over 50,000 square feet and that those would, compliance would be consistent with the same dates as for the state. And so that would be, you know, the first step. The, we also know that we have a goal of a 40% reduction in building related emissions by 2030. So whether we can reach that goal or not is an open question, but that is sort of, you know, part of the timing. And so then there are thoughts are, you know, how would we then implement carbon emission standards and potentially energy standards, but really hoping that the state takes care of that, honestly. Um, and, you know, for smaller commercial buildings, would those then be required to start complying in 2029 and then 20, you know, 30? So this first 2026 to 2030 would be first, the first uh, emissions targets. And then the question is for multifamily, would we sort of follow that same pathway? Would the larger buildings comply along with the commercial? So those same size tiers, we just do commercial and multi family um, at the same time. And that's, again, you know, this is a straw dog open question. Um, another consideration is while the state has energy targets that will get more stringent every five years, one of our questions is because of the, you know, need to do significant work in a building, do we have start with emissions targets, you know, in the first you know, staying starting in 2026 and not have second targets until 10 years later. So that's also a question with perhaps a check-in at five years to make sure that we're not losing performance. Um, and then the last thing here that I wanna call out is just that there's also, you know, based on input we've been hearing here about capitalization, recapitalization, all that. Do we actually establish a pathway, um, you know, timing pathway that might be different for affordable housing than for market rate multifamily? I think there's, you know, we're very concerned about impact on rents and concerns with displacement, but also recognize that there's a lot of housing out there being rented by folks in the tech industry, for instance, where, you know, a, that may not be as big of an issue. Um, and so do we think about subsidized affordable housing as being on a slightly different timeline? Um, do we think about unsubsidized, quote unquote, affordable housing being on a different timeline um, and uh, potentially a different pathway? So that I'm going to... Um, I'll leave this up for a minute for questions and clarifications, but you know, the point of this is this is one possible, you know, approach, the things, the way that we've laid this out. And there are a lot of variations that could be had and ways of, of uh, you know, implementing the targets when targets apply to which buildings. And so um, just would, so for the discussion that you all are having, just know that we're, we'd love to hear what you think the best pathway is for affordable housing. And then I'll open it up to questions, clarifications, and then we can switch back to your discussion when you're ready. All right, Patience, you have your hand up. Well, thank you, Sandra. I'm wondering if you could unpack the early adopter incentive piece that I think will make up part of the rulemaking work mm -hmm. and how that aligns with the state standards. Sure, so there's two things. So the state has early adopter incentives available now. And um, 
those can, and it's 85 cents a square foot um, for capital investments for uh, energy efficiency improvements in buildings. That applies both to the commercial buildings that are required to meet energy performance standards in 26, 27, and 28. It also applies to multifamily buildings over 50,000 square feet. So those incentives are available and they're available now. Um, you know, 85 cents a square foot is not going to fund your project completely, but if it can be, you know, Affordable housing owners and developers are very skilled at bringing together multiple fund sources. Um, so for the city of Seattle, we are launching um, an accelerator, a, what we're calling it the Clean Buildings Accelerator Program. And that is to help um, owners to comply with the state energy performance standards and to help them uh, sort of plan for future uh, emission standards. So, you know, in our work with building owners, it would be helping them to understand the decarbonization pathway. We have funding for that program starting in 2022 and hopefully continuing um, through the following years, but every budget is a new budget. And, um, and that funding is just uh, for coaching and some technical assistance. We are also seeking additional resources that could be applied to uh, capital support, maybe deeper engineering analysis. And um, so for instance, we have uh, the Office of Housing. Jen did a great job pulling together a proposal to the Department of Energy for weatherization innovation funds. And that would provide capital for you know, piloting three to five affordable housing projects. So our focus in terms of providing support um, in our Clean Buildings Accelerator is on under what we're calling under-resourced buildings, both you know, nonprofit commercial buildings, uh, buildings that serve lower income communities and BIPOC communities, and affordable housing is part of that as well. And definitely, I would say with the federal funding landscape, there's an, you know, an opportunity for more funding, um, you know, and with the Justice 40 initiative really looking at that. So that's that's where we are. Um, does that answer all your question? Yes, right. it does. Thank you, Sunny. And Nicole, I see you posted a chat. Um, do you want to speak to your points? Um, yeah, sure. So um, yeah, I just wanted to, to point out, and I don't, Sandra, Sandra, you, you well know this, so you're just speaking quickly that incentive for, for the state of Washington is only for buildings that are 15 EUI points worse than the target. So there is kind of a gap in there for those buildings that might be over and potentially you know, needing extra support, the buildings that we're type trying to support with the accelerator, those with less capacity. So just something to be aware of and think about as, as we um, consider incentives for Seattle specific work. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. Sure. Any more questions for Sandra? Great. Well, Sandra, thank you so much for providing that context. Um, and it's a good segue to the next conversation where we get to talk about our own roadmap and how we get to uh, zero emissions buildings. Because I think while we continue to pose the question of how do we decarbonize? We still need to continue to really get to a place where we're defining concretely what the challenges are, but what are the measures that need to be considered throughout the process. And I don't plan to present this. I plan to facilitate discussion. So we'll invite that folks really dive in in discussing 
the roadmap for affordable housing. But the overarching idea is we recognize that we do need to do the planning work. We recognize that the affordable housing community does face an acute challenge in the sense that you have really tight margins in terms of your own building costs already for existing buildings. And then the electrification that's needed for us to really decarbonize also comes with the expenses. So a lot of the planning work will unpack some of these as we get into discussion. So we believe it starts off with the proactive planning here. After the planning, we're also of the belief that we move on to prepare our infrastructure to get to a place where you can really get to that emissions reduction work. And then after that preparation, the upgrades themselves come on board and we can talk in more detail about what you believe is best to be included here. And there's conversations that we've heard, uh, even I think with this task force on considerations of some exemptions and can we talk more explicitly about what those exemptions are um, when we're looking at different building typologies or different buildings that we come across. And then after the upgrades are done, there is the monitoring and the verification, uh, which of course is the next natural step here. But I want to underscore right here, the operating costs as part of that monitoring and verification and thinking of learning from other jurisdictions in Denver and Boston, uh, some of the tools that they're using in not only having electrification, but looking at bringing in solar panels and other tools to really reduce the cost of operation. So I'll pause there, see Robert, you have your hand and that can get us started in moving this discussion and unpacking under each one. Yeah, I, I guess one of my I, I, kind of overarching question and then a, an, an, another layer like uh, is the, I, I haven't heard a lot about funding and incentives and et cetera. Um, and so I think for me, it's really challenging to have a kind of concrete conversation around what is our overall goal if um, if there isn't that conversation. We could have an overall goal and we could have a, a you know roadmap regardless of cost uh, or an objective regardless of cost and then come back around on funding. Um, acknowledging that we're going to have to be, you know, changing some things if the funding isn't there. Um, and, and maybe that's what we're trying, the, kind of where we're headed. Um, but I could see if we dig into this and be like, well, I don't know about the service to the building because I don't know if we can pay for it. You know, you, you start doing that whole dance back and forth and it kind of confuses the overall or, you know, objective if we, if, if we don't have clarity in mind, which is like, okay, we're, we're building a roadmap. We're, we have a goal in mind of net zero. We can deal with timing. We can deal with all those things based on fundings available. But I would imagine anyone on here that owns a building, you know, is going to be going, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, man. I like, I can't, I'd love to do these things, but I don't know how I'm going to pay for them. Yeah. So anyway, that that's my. And that's an excellent point to it to move our discussion forward here on this next part under planning, because we recognize the impact on cost that this would have even from right in the start and assessing what you need for electrification. So let's talk more about funding and what are the ideas that we can be moving forward here in establishing those funding sources. Um, I think of Denver and a, a specific fund that they established to support this kind of work and we can learn from some of those cities on what they have done. Madi, over to you, you have your hand up. Oh, um, actually, I it, my, it was sort of a follow-up on kind of what Robert was saying, but I, I completely agree with him. If there won't be any money there, it's gonna be very difficult to make anything happen. But, but I think in the early stages of this, a lot of these property owners aren't even gonna know what to do with the money when they get it. Um, we have to be able to, to provide them support with engineering, with, with, with uh, even just guidance on what does a project look like? What, what are the changes that will have to happen in your building? Um, and 
and and then the money has to match up to that. So um, I just wanted to make that point that I think that we have to look at those two in lockstep that 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 we can throw money at people and they're going to sit there and stare at it and not know what to do with it. Um, so we just have to make sure that we give them guidance on that or that we can provide that. Can we unpack further what the funding would be looking at? And I like how you broke it down, Marie, that it's some technical assistance needed there. What else do we want to include under this funding aspect? And then talk about how we even establish that funding source and recommending to the city um, the need that we have as a sector. Well, I, it kind of goes back to the first, uh, well, Actually, I think Sandra is bringing it up um, about, you know, the what are we trying to achieve? You know, are, are we trying to achieve, you know, net zero carbon emissions by, you know, 2040 or whatever year we're, we're shooting for? And and is there also a, an energy intensity, um, you know, ob objective in here? And I would imagine at some point there is a transition to uh, some level of renewables other than hydro, since that's not necessarily a resource that will always be at the same levels it is today. Um, you know, and, and so those kind of three things going together at various timelines along this not too far the timeline, which is 28 years or whatever it is, 2050, you know, you know where they come into play, um, then it, it, those are all funded by various you know, different types of funding. You've got, you know, just straight out grant funding. You've got, you know, energy efficiency funding. You've got, you know, loan guarantee funding. You've got, you know, we just kind of all the different ones that are out there. Um, you got, you know, private capital funding of various types that, you know, is low cost, theoretically low cost. Um, so, happy to brainstorm all these if that's our next evolution yeah, here. I think we should keep moving in that direction. Looks like Alistair's got a hand raised. I'll say have your hand. Yeah, um, this is, <laughs> these are really the, the, tough, the tough cookies, right? Um, trying to figure this stuff out. There's so much chicken and egg going on here. Um, mm -hmm. And I think patience, I think you're right. How we, how we get into a conversation about um, funding sources when there's really no, there's nothing substantial there to talk about, right? I mean, I think we can, there's a, all of the pieces of the puzzle are there, except we don't have the picture of what the puzzle is actually supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think, is that making any sense? Um, I'm reminded as I'm listening, particularly to both Marty and Robert, um, of the idea of the energy conservation utility, right? I used to work with a group up in Vermont who basically were a utility that, that created megawatts, right? So they went out and they paid to reduce energy consumption on the grid. And, and that was basically how they functioned as a utility providing energy by, by taking load off the grid. And they sort of feel like a, an emissions reduction utility might be what we need here. And I think, you know, the city's accelerator program is a step in that direction. But I, you know, as Marty points out, you know, the majority of property owners aren't going to know the first thing to do with the money if we just provide the money. Mm -hmm. So is it actually what we need is a full service utility who brings the money to bear and does the work, guides people through, actually owns those carbon emissions reductions in those buildings rather than putting it on the property owner to do that. And I don't know what that mechanism looks like in terms of, of funding that and who's paying. You know, we're creating this public good by reducing carbon emissions, but but how do we, you know, create a funding stream to monetize that work? Um, but I, I kind of feel like we've got to be thinking about a whole different way to do this 
I was really struck in the, the BPS tag conversation from, I think, last week or the week before Teresa Sweek was trying to do some back of the napkin calculations about how many buildings we have to retrofit and how much work has to be done and the time available. And it's, it's mind boggling. And so, you know, we have to have a system that is really going to be scalable and, and doing this one building at a time, one portfolio owner at a time is not going to lend itself to scaling. We need to institutionalize what we learn building by building so that it makes it more replicable mm -hmm. um, and create scalability so that, you know, as we go up the ramp towards 2030, 2040, 2050, we just become more and more efficient and, and more effective at doing, doing what it is we've got to do. And with institutionalization, Alistair, is that more of the city establishing that utility provider who can support and handhold the different types of building owners? I think so. I mean, we've talked about in the exemplary building program, we've talked about this for a while, right? The fact that um, there's a need to build capacity and provide the technical support necessary to be able to stretch to exemplary building performance um, because we recognize there's some complexity um, from a maintenance operations management standpoint. Um, many portfolio operators aren't able to bring the bandwidth to be able to do that. And so if we want it to happen quickly, I think we've got to facilitate it one way or another. Um, and I know it's a very kind of idealistic approach, but, but I don't think that we're going to get where we need to go with, with conventional thinking. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, in a different forum, I've had this conversation um, at ULI and, um, you know, the... There's never a perfect way. I mean, there's never a right way. But um, one of the ones that seems to be getting the most traction is um, some entity, whether it's a governmental entity or whatever, it is established to um, pull together the, um, the, the workforce and certainly the, a governmental entity has to obviously create the policies that support it. Um, and then the, um, the financing mechanisms are pulled together through, you know, either, you know, cost of carbon, energy, you know, energy emission reductions, you know, that creates a, a benefit, uh, particularly if the capital is being fronted by another entity. Um, you know, th there's multiple ways to fund it if your timeline is long enough. Um, if the timeline's shorter, i.e. owners got, you know, seven years to execute why, well, that owner's resources and ability to do that are pretty limited all of a sudden. If you have a long-term horizon of um, the totality and you're aggregating all these buildings together and there's incentives, then you can actually create some interesting, you know, sort of funding mechanisms that uh, can be, you know, floated and supported by, um, you know, various levels, of various types of financing, whether it be bonds or, you know, et cetera. So, um, and then you have, you know, large, you know, um, foundations that are, that are supportive of these type of things that, um, you know, if you can give overall objective of what the city's trying to achieve, you know, you probably can get participation, at least from what, you know, my early reconnaissances um, of, you know, kind of a, a pilot sort of funding that would allow, you know, the, a larger scale thing to happen later. I'm wondering, Robert, if, if we go with this large scale idea of an institution and some kind of utility entity that's meant to drive and accelerate this work and scale it, couldn't we then speed up our timeline so it's really cutting edge and innovative 
rather than staying with the same timelines. Because we intend is to make available the resources that we don't currently have to do this larger visionary work that we seem to all want to move towards. And now with this utility entity, you have an opportunity to actually speed up your timeline. Uh, I'll give it quick gut answer and then Becky's got her hand up. But um, I, I think the answer is yes. You don't really know until the devil's in the detail, but yeah, you know, I, I certainly would expect the answer to be yes. Becky, you have your hand up. Yeah, so I would, I mean, I would say why not do a building, a building performance renovation pilot, just like SCL did for the um, exemplary new construction project. And those are learning lessons as we speak, but um, <laughs> but it um, I think the players are the same. And what I really appreciated by SCL and and the the committee that has supported HCC, it was very technical assistance focused, mm -hmm. um, and. Um, also recognized, I mean, it did end up pairing with the state funding program with the state, the annual cycle of housing funding that the state puts out. And so there, a handful of the projects have state funding plus city light funding that got to, you know, over a million dollars in some cases, which was significant enough to incentivize the work um, and make it work within the stack of other funding that these projects are seeking. Um, I assume, and patients, our focus is on, on projects that, uh, for this conversation, is on projects that are uh, trying to shift to net zero in existing buildings. Existing. Okay, okay. Um, I would personally avoid the use of the word cutting edge because most affordable owners are, do not want to be cutting edge maybe in ideas, but not in technology. So you don't wanna be cutting edge on heating systems. They don't wanna be cutting edge on ventilation systems. They wanna be embracing something that is proven in other buildings, has been on the market for one to five years. And so just be careful with that. If you're whoever you're speaking with, <laughs> I agree, like let's have ambitious ideas and shift mindsets because there is this mindset. Um, not wanting to, that this work is too costly, you know, and we just need to be providing housing and, you know, these buildings in some cases are fine. But I, I think the idea of a demonstration program to kick things off quicker, you know, there's incentive funding out there right now, which is helpful. I don't think a lot of owners maybe know about it. Um, but um, the idea being is that maybe you could really target some of the worst events. You know, if 32 EUI is the, the target, but I, you know, and there's buildings out there that are 50 plus, like, you know, I'm sure every larger owner out there, SHA, Bellwether, could identify, you know, which of those buildings they feel is highest priority and, and put those on the table to understand if it's feasible to tackle them in the next, you know, three to four years. Thank you for that, Becky. I'm picking a few things from. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Congratulating myself. Well, I'm picking a few. I think you, you said very profound things. So thank you uh, for congratulating yourself. Oh, well. good Lord. Um, but I think the key pieces that I'm picking up here, and I see that we have Mari's hand up, are this ambitious idea of an entity as a recommendation, this utility provider who can do this at a large scale. Recognizing the, the reality of it may not be tomorrow, that we have that kind of institution in place. A demonstration program or a pilot program in between would be a recommendation. And I'm posing that as a question. Do we do a tiered recommendation to the city? Or do we just say, let's just have this institution be in place for nothing else? Just pausing that question. Uh, 
I, I mean, my, my, I think, a, I think pilots are great. Um, I think they demonstrate some specific performance results. They demonstrate, you know, how they demonstrate, you know, a lot of positives um, that can be translated to, you know, the next buildings, et cetera. Um, one of their limitations is, you know, larger scale financing, you know, that as long as that's a, not, a, a known entity, there's a lot of things we need to learn anyway. So um, that's where the pilots can really be positive. Um, so I, I think it's a, I think we should. I do think we're going to need to look real hard at overall the building stock and how would this, you know, whether it's a, I, I don't know if the right solution is a entity that is doing this or whether it's multiple. I, I don't know the answer to that, but um, mm -hmm. there needs to be some way to, for if um, public resources are going towards incentives and, you know, um, uh, decarbonization, et cetera, that, that there's an ability to tap into the benefits created from that to create more financing for the further execution. Yeah. And what, what does the Office of Housing fit in this? That's not a question. Marty, you had your hand up before I'll start. Oh, um, I, yeah, I was going to say, I, I strongly support there being some sort of central entity that, that provides the guidance to organizations and what to do and directs them to where the funding sources are. And because everybody's going to be swimming independently and, and, and it's going to be chaos. <laughs> Otherwise, I think if we don't have somebody who's kind of a driver, um, in the middle of it. Uh, I was just going to speak a little bit to what Becky was saying and that she spoke very much with a bellwether voice in that we we do kind of have a policy of we will not be the test subjects uh, for new technology. Uh, it doesn't mean we won't be aggressive. Uh, I, you know, I, I think we act very aggressively toward um, carbon reductions. And I think that that's a, a pursuit we can support, but it'll only be, I think we'll only be able to support that with tested technologies so yeah i agree with that i think let's get it tested before we do any guinea pigging i'll start over to you yeah um i think there was something else that came up for me when we were talking before wow. but on that that um that issue of of tested technology um, and Marty, Becky, anybody who's in the kind of management role, I'd be interested to hear, you know, because obviously one of the strategies we're looking at very closely is switching to heat pump water heaters, right, for domestic hot water, the biggest single chunk we can take out of the fossil fuel base in multifamily buildings. And, and whether that feels to you like untested technology at this point it, no you feel comfortable with that yeah no we're, we we are already implementing that technology that in yeah. our buildings now so yeah 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 okay because because i don't think that we're looking to go i don't think there's anything that that's really cutting edge that we're talking about in terms of retrofits so i just wanted to kind of get a sense of where that that feeling that comfort level was because i think it's a key one because because understanding how we get everybody comfortable with that and, um, and to make sure that every team isn't having to reinvent the wheel, right? Because we've learned a lot about how to size and design and install heat pump hot water systems. People have made a lot of the mistakes already and we don't wanna to have to repeat them. And yet it's really hard to get the industry to the table to learn from that, you know, and what we've seen in the exemplary building program is that it's the usual suspects that show up to all the education and the people that need the education are not the ones that show up. And so again, figuring out how we have that entity or that portal, you have that clearinghouse that makes sure that, that information is shared and that learning is available to all. So it becomes a fairly collaborative process. Um, which gets a little bit to the other thing which came up 
for me, which I think is a challenge in my head and just want to put it on the table. You know, we're in the middle of doing these audits, building audits now. Marty, thank you for your support from Bellwether and, and all the others involved. Um, so we are, you know, looking very specifically at a set of buildings. We're going to have pretty good audit information in terms of what this retrofit would look like to get to goal. So we're kind of by default um, creating the potential for some pilots right there in terms of getting the, the beginning information. Um, but I am conscious that there's a lack of equity in how that has happened, right? That, that we have targeted 15 buildings based on their typology. We've selected them based purely on, on you know, a small number of parameters. Um, and so that wouldn't necessarily be a fair way to take a step next into pilots. So I think that's something to be thinking about is if we were going to go for pilots, what sort of process would we need to be conscious of in terms of um, identifying which are pilots? And would it be justifiable to say, well, because we've taken this step and these are good examples, and we have some data, could we move to the next step? And then to, I think, Robert's point about What's the best way to allow this? I mean, you know, there's no right way to do it. What's the best way to, to kind of catalyze the marketplace to, to get active, right? Um, and is there a way that a resource that's at the city level could be the catalyst that, that gets people to engage? So there is funding available there are some hard targets coming towards us in terms of building performance standards. And here's a technical assistance, this, the, the accelerator program, if you like. Um, here's this resource that's available and here's a process for how you can get involved. And I, the, the block power, is everybody familiar with the block power program? It's going on in New York and I think maybe somewhere in California now. Um, I don't. I don't know the system very well, but it seems to me it's an example of how some of these things are coming together um, to try and create market activity and a, and a kind of transition in the marketplace to restructure how this stuff happens. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm just kind of spitballing. Great spitballing, Alistair. I think great ideas came out of that. So a few pieces that I am picking up here in conversations are we are moving forward with the recommendation of this entity that will combine resources and technical assistance, um, whether it's establishing a new entity or it's having a, an existing one begin to do this work is another question that I have in mind. And I'm curious, Sandra, I know this is not a place for you to respond at this very point, but in your interactions with um, the Office of Housing, and I know that the application for the Department of Energy grant does have some retrofit piloting that's intended, do we see potential partnership there just at a high level from your perspective? And it doesn't look like Jen is on here. And I'll start, she had to jump off. But absolutely, I think um, that was, you know, part of the idea, I think, when we submitted the grant and in reaching out to HDC was, you know, you know the industry, the affordable housing industry, as does OH, obviously, but, you know, and ha have this membership. And so the idea, I think, would be that the, buildings could be drawn from, you know, working with you all to do that. I think, you know, it's that particular grant isn't set up in the way that I think some of this discussion has been about like an entity who can provide yeah. um, an outside. I mean, it's really OH who would be managing the process and providing some of that, which, you know, is great. Um, so yes, absolutely to partnership. I think that's the way this is going to happen. And you know, this isn't going to be all the Office of Housing or all some other entity or all the individual you know, uh, housing providers. So um, one thing I just wanted, you know, in listening to the discussion and, and you know, who this, you know, 
entity or entities might be to sort of bring this together. It does seem to me that in some of the uh, federal funding, there's, you know, that will be coming out um, or things we're hearing that there's a real interest in, you know, quote unquote, supporting community entities. And so to the extent that not, you know, everything needs to be run through a city or a state that there may be ways, you know, and community is tossed around broadly, right? But I think the idea being sort of those who are closer to the work that needs done might be in a better position. And so it, you know, it could be a program through the city, it could be an independent, program. It could be, you know, to Becky's point, like a resilient, you know, I mean, you've talked about this work as resilient retrofits um, and that this is a launching pad to sort of, you know, demonstration projects and, you know, potentially more full scale. So just noting that I think there's an opportunity with the federal funding that it, it could go to, you know, more community oriented entities. Yeah, and I think there's a place to learn from. I think Montgomery has an equity fund, and I believe from my research, it's managed by a third party or coordinated by some kind of third party. There's lots of examples out here. I mean, Washington, D.C. has got a very active green. They, they have a multiple buckets. Um, I think there's ways to do green banks. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that we yeah. can do in this area. Mm -hmm. We have a like, okay, here's our goal. Here's what we're going towards. Now, how do we put this all together? Office of Housing will play a part. Seattle City Light will play a part. I mean, everyone will play a part, but, you know, we kind of got to all be going towards the same goal. Mm -hmm. So as a next step, would it help for us to compile those examples and begin to draft a more defined recommendation around what it is that we believe would be best for our own community here in Seattle. Yeah, the, the only, okay, so we've got, we have a goal, Sandra, correct me if I'm wrong here, so um, X, net zero by X date in the city of Seattle, there's a energy reduction goal, is that accurate, or am I just hearing things and jumping out there? Um, there is, I will say there is an energy reduction goal. It is, I will also say that the energy reduction goal is part of the larger um, carbon emissions reduction goal. So one of the ways to get to carbon emissions reduction is energy reduction. I think we all recognize that energy efficiency is important for resource efficiency. And somebody mentioned, you know, I mean, I think City Light feels very confident that there are adequate resources to electrify our buildings, but being efficient with those resources is always critical. So um, I'm dancing around your question. Um, <laughs> but so All there's right. not a specific energy goal. The energy goal is in the service of, of emissions reduction, but is important. Am I wrong? I could be, by the way. <laughs> uh, I th isn't Seattle City Lights fuel mix like 90% renewable? Yes, it's 85% emissions free and then everything else we purchase offsets to make it emissions neutral. So in terms of carbon reduction, while it's super important, it's it, overall, we're not talking about a big number here, are we? Like most of our carbon is coming from embedded carbon, isn't it? I don't know. It would, maybe I'm... it would be for any fossil fuel that's still in the building. Right. Right. So it's not, okay. I don't think, Sandra, I don't know if it's, if electricity, I don't know if there's been discussions around that, if electricity will even be counted or if it's just purely looking at fossil fuel sources when it comes to the carbon reduction goal. We, we have talked about that, whether you just look at the fossil fuel emissions or whether you include the electric cases, pros and cons to either way, one of the pros to including uh, electric emissions is to spur efficiency. And also politically, let's not, uh, you know, all energy sources are part of this mix. So, um, yeah. 
I will say on on that though, even if we were just focusing on scope one emissions, so like just fossil fuel emissions, um, that uh, just from the building owner's perspective, tackling efficiency is going to be very advantageous because you want to get your service size to be as small as possible so that when you electrify, you really don't have to. So like that was one of the things that when I was looking at this chart, you're sharing patients. It's like, and Alistair referred to this chicken and egg, egg issue too, but like we wouldn't want you to go about upgrading your electrical service before you've done all of your efficiency work. And so mm -hmm. that would be like part of the planning process, right? Would be like, if you can afford to do all those projects at once, by all means do them. But if you can't, you should sequence it so you're doing your efficiency first, um, which maybe is not what will help with the carbon reductions, but it really would help you from your cost perspective to try to get your you know, it's going to be a, a waste of a beautiful heat pump system if it's all going out the roof. <laughs> <laughs> you want to you want to get the building to be in a really good shape so that it can really take all the advantages of that of that new system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and that raises an interesting point. Um, you know, just thinking about the all electric buildings that we're looking at at the moment because we do have all electric buildings in the audit group because we set the 32 EUI as one of the parameters that we were looking at. And so how do you get a building that's at 50 or 60 EUI that's all electric? How do you get it to 32? Um, but you know, perhaps in this conversation, those buildings are exempt in the near term, but is there benefit to getting them to 32, if, I mean, you know, if our Seattle building performance standard is an emissions standard, that in itself isn't going to be driving them towards efficiency, but is the reason to think about efficiency for other reasons, I mean, beyond just reducing operating cost, obviously. I mean, I think that's one of the things would be kind of interesting to understand there because there is this capacity question. And I know, Madeline, we, we've kind of touched on this before and City Light is obviously pretty confident that you're okay from a capacity point of view, you're gonna be able to deal with it. Right, right. but it's, it's still a cost for, like if the transformer is hosted on site by the customer, like you, if you had to upgrade your own electrical infrastructure, like that's still really expensive for the customer. So it's more yeah. like in the economics, like trying to make it pencil out and everything, like that's a big significant cost that, a big multifamily building would have to take on. So it's, it's right. not from a, from a transmission distribution perspective, like Seattle City Light is, is doing good. Energy efficiency is gonna to continue to be very important, but it's when you come down to like the building level and each individual project, even if we have sufficient capacity, it's still gonna translate into a cost if you have to add service to your building. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I'm actually talking about the opposite situation because more typically what we're going to see is all electric buildings that have a big service and could reduce their load. Yeah, and that's great. Yeah. <laughs> so you you are interested in that, even though it's not going light to is. change. Yeah. yeah, it's not going to change the BPS as far as that building is concerned, right? You're all, you know, yeah, they would be covered. That would be more a target of the Washington State BPS yeah. to reduce their footprint. Right. Because, so, I mean, well, so just to, to kind of finish that thought and, and then I'll be quiet about it. So the, the maybe is a need for a metric in here somewhere in, in the building performance standard that does look at emissions, and we've talked about this emissions per square foot, you know, kind of emissions intensity or emissions per bedroom, emissions per person housed, as maybe being one of the things that, that does still need to be in there. But if, if they're on all city light electricity and they're all electric, that metric doesn't make any sense. So is there a need for something else that will help to drive the efficiency standard? Or do we, you know, let the state do that at the point that the state eventually piles that onto multifamily. But, but why, why would we let the state do it when the city of Seattle is so dramatically different than almost every other city out there? Right. In the state, at least. Uh, 
So, Robert, we set the metric here. Say that again? So, we set the metric here at a local level. Is that what we want? I, to I think we should. I mean, we're, we have the most hydro power of any city in the state, if I'm right about that, for sure. Um, and therefore, we have a fairly, I and mean, we, we can set our own standard that we think will, or we, everybody thinks will create the energy efficiency investment needed, probably have to fund it in some way too, by the way, um, you know, or incentivize it in some way. And it goes hand in hand with the energy reduction objective, I'm sorry, the uh, carbon reduction objectives that, that are, you know, you just, you're dovetailing along. So it's taking what Sandra said and making it explicit. So I am noting a recommendation that we would ask the city to set an emissions metric to simplify this for building owners. Am I correct in understanding that way? That's what I'd advocate. Would you set an emission standard but prioritize fossil fuel, fossil fuel reduction? Maybe so the point is to hit the, the worst offenders first, right? Or to sorry, to help the first, the worst offenders first, which I think you know may come out uh, in some of Al uh, Alistair's auditing process. I mean, you're going to do all this work on auditing these buildings. Some of them may rise up as candidates to actually tackle first, right? Right. Um, and and so with all that fresh data in hand, when it do it. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, the, the more explicit, the better. Because I think, I do think that's a lot of owners, like their headspace around this is real. If, you know, they've got it like, oh, these are, this is just tree hugger. We need to, once again, back to just providing the housing. And so the more explicit you can be about this is why these standards are coming out. It's for these clear policy goals, these, this clear carbon reduction. Thank you, Becky. Sandra, I see you have your hand up. If you want to jump in and help us here. Yeah, it's more of a clarification question. I thought I was actually hearing a push for some energy standards in conjunction with the emission standards. So I just want to make sure uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I, that's what I thought I was hearing. Yeah, I that that that's actually where I was leaning, and and let me expand a little. So I'm looking at the I'm looking at the selection, the building selection at the moment. We have five buildings that are all electric, and their EUIs range from a low of thirty six point five to a high of 51. Um, so, you know, fairly broad, broad range. And, and I think what I'm trying to get clear on my head is, is how do we prioritize where in the timeline do we prioritize those all electric buildings if, if we're essentially saying that they are at zero emissions, if they're all electric city light, they're already at zero emissions. So should we just be ignoring them? Or if, if they're, you know, substantially high on the energy spectrum, is the value to bringing them down to an EUI target of 32 or whatever in order to help free up capacity in the system? Because simultaneously, you know, we've got a whole lot of gas, hot water or gas, hot water and space heat buildings that we are going to be trying to convert over to electricity. So we are going to be putting more load on the electric grid. Is it part of the responsibility of this process, this initiative, the policy to actually help create capacity in the grid to service those buildings that we're planning to convert? Or, or should we not be thinking about that? 
and particularly in the affordable housing space, should we not be thinking about that? Right? I mean, I think that's that's my question because because as I say, we've identified a set of of buildings that you know because they're electric resistance heat and electric resistance hot water, they are pretty high EUI buildings typically. Um, but should we I be ignoring them? In the affordable housing space, you should absolutely be focusing on it because the tenant is paying the bill. They are the one who's writing the check every month, unless it's a HUD project, sorry. But even then, it's, it, it, you know. So it, it's a, you know, you have an energy poverty issue. You have a, an ability to actually, it's easier to finance that in an affordable property because you can right. reduce your utility allowance. Um, so you can actually, anyway, they, they get a little more complicated, but you don't, you don't have to increase your net rent totally. You know, if the tenants saving 50 bucks, then you could use a portion of that to, you know, finance it. Um, the, anyway, I, I actually think it's a, it's an opportunity to save the tenant net money and create efficiency and affordable housing at the same time. Yeah, I, 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 I would add to that. I think it's I think it's important to have the two together in the sense that we are as we are electrifying buildings. Some of my worst performing buildings are my all electric buildings. Yeah. So, um, what we can learn from trying to improve those buildings can help guide us in what we do when we electrify. Uh, buildings that currently use gas. Uh, I'd also say that the systems that are using gas in almost every case, it, we're going to have to bring in service to those buildings. Um, there's almost no option for uh, making that building so efficient that we never have to add electric. Uh, we will be adding electric to all those buildings. Yeah, so. unless, so Marty, do you have any buildings that you've converted from electric to gas in the last 10 years through weatherization incentives or other incentives? No, I have a couple that I'm looking at trying to do that either this year or next year, but I don't have stop, any. Stop, stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So SHA has several buildings, right, that they converted over to condensing gas boilers in the last decade, which obviously have the electric capacity because they were all electric prior to that. So there's a there's a typology that you know already has that infrastructure in place. I don't want to get into the weeds of, of that stuff, but um, yeah, I just so you know to to um, Robert's point. If I mean, obviously there is the imperative to reduce utility costs wherever possible as part of that process. Is it justifiable to roll that into the BPS into this conversation? Or should that just be a separate conversation that's about reducing overall utility cost, or, or can we embed it in this building performance standard? Does that make sense? Because you know, on the one hand, we're talking about being very focused on emissions reductions. The electric, all electric story is different, but it might be a useful leverage point to be able to help get that work done as part of this as a kind of more holistic package. I was just listening to this, and to me, this seems like a large part of it. It's a utility question on their capacity. So I'm sure Madeline's thinking about that. But um, I, I mean, I, I work in energy efficiency. I, ideally, yes, that's the ideal world. Everyone is, but I, I just, I have a hard time wrapping my head around if it's a challenge for, especially in affordable housing, for those buildings who need to reduce emissions to do that, then at the same time to also do the energy efficiency in the other buildings. It's like there's a capacity and the cost issue. And I just wonder what the trade-offs are and, and logistically how that can all be done. So the timing point is, is critical. And I, I heard that. But also just thinking back to this one, the one study we did with the housing authority, which was one of those situations where they had a gas, um, newer gas boilers, and they used to be electric, so they had the electric capacity. Um, that would work pretty well in that study, but then when we looked at making the building really efficient by upgrading, um, I think it was a VRF system to get rid of the um, baseboard heating, it was like the cost was just 
quadrupled, tripled. I mean, it was so expensive. And, I, you know, what's the trade-off of that versus maybe doing it, being able to do more emissions reduction in other buildings sooner? So I, I just, I think it's a balance and I, I think it's an interesting discussion, but I have a hard time just wrapping my head around like doing all of it at once. So the timing, it seems incredibly important to think about and prioritization. So for this one, I am trying to synthesize what I've heard, but I want to invite you, Alster, to help wrap up what you've heard as feedback to your recommendation and what folks are feeling is the best approach here between the energy efficiency and the emissions approach. What do we include in our recommendations from your takeaway from the feedback? Mm. I'm, I'm torn and I don't know whether I can wrap my head around it right now I kind of need to sketch it out on the wall I think um, mm. I my gut says I mean I'm as, as some of you at least know I'm all about this net present value of emissions reductions what we do now is way more valuable than what we do 10 years from now so, you know, based on resources, how do we get the most bang for the bug? And, and so on that basis, focusing first on fossil fuels seems to be the right choice and worrying less about those all electric buildings um, should be secondary. As long as there isn't, you know, um, a demand management benefit on the the utilities part, you know, that the, by taking load off the grid so that we can add new load from other buildings, if that is actually a constraint, a choke point, then, then it would be important to do that. So I'm not sure we can actually drop it all the way. And I am kind of conscious of, of the need to help reduce the operating costs of those all electric buildings. But I think it's... I, I must say, I do kind of feel like it's it's second tier. It's not first tier that we really should focus on the the emissions and therefore where there's fossil fuels being used on site. Um, so scope one versus scope two from that point of view, that that should be the first priority. Um, and from the utility perspective, like, yes, we would appreciate energy efficiency. Like we have funding to fund energy efficiency too. And like, that's a priority right. to the utility. And I feel like uh, from for the sake of the building owners and kind of echoing Becky's feedback, like I would rather have this building performance standard be really straightforward and focus on like the purpose of it is to reduce emissions. And this, the EUI metric really only comes into play for these multifamily buildings because it's already the commercial buildings over 50,000 are covered by the, the state BPS. So it's not, it's not an issue for a lot of the bigger buildings, but for, for these affordable housing and, and other multifamily buildings is the only place where they're kind of like left without an EUI metric. But I, I feel like if we try to capture that into this re regulation as well, it'll, it might get cumbersome. <laughs> um, and I prefer to keep it as like straightforward as possible and just have the scope one emissions metric be the target. Yeah. And there's lots of cities that have done it, but where they've put them both in, though. You guys, I mean, so when we say it's going to be complicated, it's like we're not really invent, inventing anything new. Yeah. There's, you're the, I mean, it's your, you have a better perspective on this than I do. Like, you're the one who'll be impacted. So if you're saying it's something you want, and that's more valuable than I'm saying. I'm just saying from the utility perspective, for us, I don't. I don't think the juice is worth the squeeze, but if for you guys it's there, then yeah, of course, I'd love to see energy uh, efficiency incorporated. Uh, I think <laughs> any of the things that we, that we do and we don't create funding and incentives for is all going to squeeze, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, I'm all for it, but I'm also all for, uh, you know, creating a funding mechanism that's multi-tiered that, you know, those that can pay more, pay more, those that can't pay more, have more support for it and so uh, but and i think i i think we need to have the the goal first and then we really got to work hard on figuring out the that function of like how do we get there 
you know, because mm -hmm. it's great to have these objectives, you know, and we need them. Mm -hmm. But I think we got a long way to go still before you can say, okay, we're going to roll this thing out. Well, yeah. and I think, and I think back to the idea of, um, you know, the if, if this say converting from gas, right? That's a big effort, and and so um, while owners are doing that effort, would you know they're likely motivated to also tackle some efficiency issues as well. So, and I, I, I really did appreciate the case study that was done with SHA because it was like, hey, these are the things, these are the five um, actions we think would most improve both emissions and efficiency at this building. And it was around, you know, heating and cooling and the envelope and the roof, you know? And so, and to me, the, you know, the fortunate thing is like, those, that really is it, right? <laughs> and of course, there are different um, strategies, but I think to come up with um, you know, putting a menu in front of owners like the built smart program in some ways, I kind of go back to that, like of saying, all right, you've got this older building and you know, what, how are you heating the building? What kind of windows do you have in there? What's your R value, you know? And can, you know, what, what would, what do, you all see as the highest priority areas to focus on and is it feasible to tackle? And then, yeah, how, how, much, re, how much does it cost? <laughs> how much could be supported by reserves or, or financing sources already available to the building and what would that gap be? Yeah. Well, okay, so very, it's easy to say in two minutes, but, <laughs> but I do, you know, once again, there's this, like, with the, with the building is built, right? So there's only so much that's feasible to realistically touch. Um, like, net zero could be quite challenging because it has just a really small, right? Um, that's already filled with a lot of things. Um, so. Keep in mind, though, we're also dealing with a long timeline here. Like, I mean, we may not get, you may not get to net zero uh, initially. You may, you know, your roof may not, it may be fine. So it's not getting touched for 15 years or 20 years or something. And until you do that, you realistically don't have a real shot at it. And, you know, then you have windows. Well, they're going to get have to get done at some point, too. So anyway, it, I just think there's a phase in effort. And that's where I think the. Um, policy has to allow for latitude of kind of best efforts and doing the doing the things that you can today, but you're on a path and a plan and et cetera. I must say this has been a great discussion and the kind of collaboration and thinking that we really need to shape our recommendations. We've unfortunately come to the top end of the hour. And I would like to offer that we have a working document where these draft recommendations can be edited by some of you with the level of depth that you are providing in terms of the direction that we should go in these recommendations. In particular, this last aspect on whether we're focusing on emissions or energy intensity use uh, and reduction as a recommendation. I think that still needs to be thought out and fully defined. Uh, and then I think there was clarity on this funding aspect and we need to fully flesh that out and plan to have a discussion at our next meeting, reviewing some of those recommendations. And we are planning for the May meeting to not only have the city come and share more in detail what they have in their proposal currently, uh, so we can align with some of our thinking so far, but we're also thinking of inviting folks who are doing this similar work elsewhere, the folks in Denver in particular, uh, to come and speak to this group and share their own learnings as well. So with that, thank you everyone and have a wonderful rest of your day. Yeah, thanks everybody. Hi. Thank you.